welcome to Laughter in the Law, where we talk about the law with a lighthearted twist. Hey, thanks for coming back. This is Jackie Hauser of Flexner Hauser Injury Law. And this is Diane Belmont, her trusty sidekick and office manager. Okay, so Jackie, we're almost coming up to a year with starting this podcast, which is kind of crazy to think about. Yeah. And I think I've learned a lot just from sitting across from you mm-hmm. and picking your brain, but also trying to understand like where you're coming from and how you try to help even people that aren't your clients. You're just trying to get some sage advice out there, make people a bit more informed. But one thing that I really enjoy are your stories mm-hmm. of just like the different chapters of your life. But you just have some really interesting stories. So I was hoping you would share, you know. Yeah. And specifically, I was thinking about, you know, you talk about how in your journey, you were first a legal secretary and then you became a paralegal. But then there was a certain point where you even left that and you were a teacher and you Mm -hmm. were teaching the courses that you went through to get your paralegal degree. Right. I was just wondering, you know, Mm -hmm. how did you get to be a paralegal teacher, instructor. Okay. Instructor, yeah. Mm. Yeah, whenever you teach at the community college level, unless you have a, a doctorate, they call you instructor. If you have a doctorate, then they call you doctor so-and-so. Mm. But there are, you know, like in the sciences and stuff, there'll be some doctors there. But there aren't any, well, I guess there could be by now, there could be some doctors of paralegal stuff. So but. what's the difference between an instructor and a professor? A professor is usually at the university level. Oh, okay. And okay, instructor okay. is usually at the community community college level. Okay. Um, now, you know, I taught in the 90s and the early 2000s, so that could have changed in the past 20 years. Mm-hmm. But whenever I was an instructor, you know, that's what I was. I was an instructor. So. Okay, so you instructed at one community college? Let me think. Yes. Whenever I was teaching as a paralegal instructor, I was just teaching at one community college. I started off as a legal secretary, and we talked about this probably in one of the early, maybe even the first podcast. You know, that was always my dream to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. But my family wasn't wealthy. That wasn't going to happen. Not on my parents' budget. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, I thought the next best thing was to work in a law office. And so I went to the community college and got a secretarial degree. I think today we call them admin assistants, but back then they were secretary. You either was a medical secretary, a legal secretary, or a general secretary. Mm -hmm. I think I took the general route. I don't even think I took the legal route. I just Mm -hmm. think I just just took the general route. I got hired by this fella who was going out on his own, a sole practitioner, and I started off as his secretary, Tom Barwick, great attorney. Hey, Tom. (laughs) Still love Tom to this day. And uh, so started off with him as a legal secretary, and he quickly said, Jackie, I think you got a lot of potential. He said, would you be willing to go back to school and go to take paralegal courses? And I said, what is a paralegal? Because, you know, this was in the 80s. This profession was so young in the 80s. And so I really was there at the birth of a profession. And so he told me about some classes. They were in a college about 60 miles away. And so I started there. And I started taking these paralegal classes and just started drowning myself in it. It was just everything I'd always wanted because mm-hmm. I wanted to be a lawyer, right? Mm-hmm. And then I was getting the experience during the day and then taking classes at night. And, oh, my goodness, I was just in heaven. Mm-hmm. Eventually, though, a college that was closer to me started their paralegal program. And it was half the driving distance. <laughs> and I was like, whoops, sign me up. Mm-hmm. So I moved and I actually graduated from that college. That was Johnston Community College in Johnston County. And I started in that program. I was already just about finished. So I graduated in 92 from Johnston, while at the same time working during the day, having two babies, you know, all that kind of good stuff. So being a working mom and all that. And so I graduated in 92. And the year that I graduated, my favorite professor, who I love, Joy Howerton, hey, Miss Howerton, (laughs) she was expecting and she said, she just told me one day after class, she just said, hey, Jackie, stay after class a second. I'll stay after class. She goes, hey, I'm going to be out next semester, and I'd like for you to teach some of my classes. Wow. And I was just like, I don't think I've ever done that before. I've never even taught Sunday school. I've never taught wow. anything before. And she said, yeah, I just want you to teach some of my classes. I'm just going to be out next semester, and I was hoping you could help out. Like at night with a couple of the classes, you're really good at Civ Pro. You're really good at, you know, litigation, blah, blah, blah. And I was like, yeah, sure, if they'll let me. Yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> So then she has the baby, and she decides, I'm not coming back. 
Wow. And so then I just start this process of teaching part-time at night in the program that I've just graduated from. And I did that for about six years, teaching part-time. While also full-time paralegal. Uh, yeah. Well, everything else in life is going on. Yes. Wow. <laughs> everything else is going on. And mother of young children. Yeah. Wow. Mother of elementary kids. And so I do that for about six years, but I really do enjoy it. I'm driving to the school two, sometimes three nights a week to teach these classes to these students who are driving to school because this is long before we had online classes, mm -hmm. didn't have that kind of stuff. And I fell in love with it. I really did. I loved watching the students get it. You can see when they get it. You can see the ones who care. And usually if you're driving to school at night after you've worked all day, you care. Yeah. You know, yeah. you don't have a bunch of slugs there at night. These people are there to learn. Mm -hmm. And a lot of them are coming from the same place that I was. You know, they're working all day and then coming in at night. And a lot of them are working in law offices and stuff. And so in 2000, the opportunity arose for me to teach full time. And they just approached me one day and just said, you know, so-and-so is retiring and we have a slot and we'd love for you to be a full-time instructor. And it was perfect timing on so many different fronts that I just can't even talk about. But I just said, yes, absolutely, sign me up, you know. Yeah. And I loved teaching. I loved teaching full-time. I loved teaching. I loved teaching at night, but I loved whenever it just became my job. And that's all that I did was just prepare to teach and study and prepare and teach and lecture. And once again, loved that experience. But the whole time that I was doing all of that, in the back of my mind was still that little girl saying, I want to be a lawyer. Wow. You know. Wow. So what courses were you teaching? In the paralegal program, I taught everything except I just, I didn't teach a lot of the real estate courses because I had a, um, the lead instructor was really real estate and the state's heavy. So he taught all the estates, will states of trust. He taught real estate. I taught criminal law, civil lit, evidence, commercial law. Business law. Same thing. Oh, okay. We okay. called it commercial law, but it's the same thing okay. as business law. Family? Family law. Okay. I taught all the law classes except for real estate. And then I taught ethics. I taught an intro course to paralegal studies just to kind of, you know, get people's feet wet. Mm -hmm. Taught legal research, analytical writing. That's hard to say. Analytical writing. <laughs> <laughs> so um, how were you as a teacher? Like, I'm sure every instructor has a strategy. Like first day of school or within the first weeks, you want to set some type of tone. Want to let them know that you're either the fun teacher or the one to be afraid of. Like, what was your strategy? Well, my strategy, I did find out with the day students sometimes, especially ones that are, you know, they graduated in May from high school and now they don't know what they want to do. So we'll just take these paralegal courses and see what if we like it. Mm -hmm. I was passionate about being a paralegal. And so you either wanted to be a paralegal or you didn't. And I kind of equated it to nursing. You know, mm -hmm. you just don't nonchalantly jump into the nursing program. Mm -hmm. And, you know, the nursing program certainly had other hoops you had to jump through. And our program didn't. You could just sign up and show up. And so a lot of times, you know, it was – the instructor's responsibility to kind of cull the field. <laughs> and mm. so one... So you were trying to definitely set a tone up. This is not going to be just an easy class, yeah. an easy grade. I'll, give you, I'll tell you one thing I did okay. in one class. This is probably mean of me to do it. But in commercial law, commercial law is really tough. It's a tough course. Mm -hmm. And we call it a commercial law because we took business one and two and combined them. So okay. we, most of the time, if you're taking business administration or if that's your major, you take business law one, you take business law two. And we just combined the two, so we just called it commercial law. And the book was huge and expensive, and the first, like, 12 chapters was really just kind of an overview of all law. Mm -hmm. And then after that, after part one of the book, you got into business law and how to write contracts and stuff like that. But chapters 1 through 12 covered everything from bankruptcies to Fair Debt Collection Practices Act and blah, blah, blah. It just dense, dense material. Yeah. So the first 10 days of class, I covered two chapters a day, and I said there'll be a test on chapters 1 through 10 once we finish them, and that'll be one of your four tests in this course. And so we just covered a chapter a day. I said two chapters a day, yeah. but I think I was wrong. I think it was one chapter a day. So for the first 10 days, one chapter a day, boom, 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 this dense material, mm -hmm. covering it and moving on to the next day, covering it and moving on, asking questions in class. Mm -hmm. And, you know, everybody's glazing over by about the third day. They're like, this is hard. Mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. So by about that 10th day, whenever people can drop class and not get penalized for it and everything, Mm -hmm. you've kind of weeded out the ones who aren't interested. Mm -hmm. And we get past that 10th chapter and we come in on test day and I know who's dropped out. And I say, we're not going to have a test on this material. (gasps) No. (laughs) Oh, you evil thing. The sole purpose of what I did those first two weeks was, number one, to give them a good foundation of the law. Yeah. But I wasn't going to test them on any of that. Wow. But. Did anyone discover your trick? Or did any, like, the mm, upper classmen? I don't know. It worked pretty effectively. I mean, wow. by the second week, people were dropping like crazy. Wow. So, yeah. <laughs> wow. That was, I know that was evil on my part, but. I didn't have any other way to handle those folks who may not really be interested. Yeah, so. and you didn't want your time wasted. Like, no. don't waste my time. Don't waste your time. No, yeah. no, no. Take your book back. Get your money back and go find out what you want to study. Yeah. Okay, all right, all right. But you weren't always a mean teacher. I don't think that was mean. Okay, okay. I think that was actually, I was, that was a gift I gave them. They realized <laughs> I don't want to study the law. And this lady has made it apparent that I don't want to do that. Okay, but what did you ever have fun? Did I? <laughs> did you ever have fun with your classes? Yeah, we did some cool things. I mean, whenever I first started working for Mr. Barwick, I had a general practice. Mm. So we did everything, whatever walked in the door. Now, he did take a bankruptcy one time, and we didn't do bankruptcy, and we had never done a bankruptcy. But Tom took a bankruptcy, and I cried. I cried doing that bankruptcy. Mm -hmm. I mean, it was just me and him. I couldn't lean over to the person sitting next to me and go, hey, how do we do this? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Fortunately, there was an attorney across the street who did bankruptcies. And why in God's name, this man didn't, we didn't send him across the street. I don't know. Mm -hmm. But I did tell Tom that day. I said, if you ever take another bankruptcy, I will quit. Mm -hmm. I will just quit. Mm Because I'm telling you, I don't know what I did. I don't know whether I did it right. That's the danger of it. I don't know what I did, Mm -hmm. but working with Tom, we did have a general practice, and so we did do some criminal law. We did felonies and misdemeanors and and certainly big boy court and things Mm -hmm. like that. And so whenever I got to teaching criminal law at Johnston Community, I certainly enjoyed that because it wasn't something I did every day by that point. You Mm -hmm. know, by that point, I'd worked mainly in a civil firm. We Mm -hmm. kind of honed our craft and started focusing on civil stuff. And so I enjoyed that. And we would kind of tag along with the criminal justice students whenever they would do field trips. And every year, the criminal justice students, every spring, they did a day field trip where in the morning they went to Central Prison and did a field trip there. And then in the afternoon, we went cross town in Raleigh and went to the women's, quote, maximum security prison, which they also call women's campus. Mm -hmm. And so that was always fun to do that. The first one you said, what, the first camp? The men's prison, maximum security. Yeah, yeah the Central men's prison. Pr- Central prison. Yeah. So who all would be in there? Oh, that's everything. Central prison actually has a ward where it's just the psych, the psych prisoners. Wow. We never went to the psych ward. We're, nobody's allowed in there. No visitors are allowed. I can understand. But as visitors, we would get a tour inside Central prison. At times, you know, we would be in the same hallway, or if we went to their cafeteria and they were eating or something, we would see them there. If they were at their canteen, we would go by their pods. A lot of them are in these pods of maybe four cells where you got four people in each cell, and then they have a common area. Mm -hmm. One of the interesting things that happened at Central Prison, what I learned, my first time there, I learned a lot. So the second time we went on the trip, my goal was to be near the guards. Mm. I want to be near the guards. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I don't want to be at the back unless there's a guard at the back. You know, sometimes there was, there should have been a guard at the back. There should have been a guard at the front and a guard at the back. I don't want to be in the middle. I want to be near the guard. Not that the guard had a gun. I mean, you know, basically all they had, I think was pepper spray or something like that. But nevertheless. So the cool thing about central prison is whenever you're moving from one place to another, there's people in rooms that operate the doors. You don't open and shut doors. Someone from a control room opens and shuts doors. So they open the door for us, and you have to walk into the hallway, and then they shut the door behind you because they're not going to open the next door until everybody's in. That's a security measure. So here we all go, about 10 or 15 of us, walking into the hallway, They shut the door behind us. 
great. And then, you know, we motion to the person up ahead, and they open the door ahead of us. And as they do, in on the other side walks a bunch of prisoners along the, the opposite wall. We're along one wall, and they're coming in on the other wall. Oh, wow. And we're both in this hallway. And these prisoners are all dressed in red. Now, in prison, different colors mean different things. Mm -hmm. Now, probably 90% of the people that were with me didn't know what the red outfit meant. I knew what red meant. Mm -hmm. Red meant death row. Yikes. These are death row prisoners in the hallway with us. (laughs) And did y'all get out the open door before? And as they come in, no, because what's the protocol? Shut the door. Whoa. So they shut the door. So now there's two shut doors on both sides. And we're in the hallway with six or eight death row inmates. And how many guards? Two. Two guards. Yeah, one at the front, one at the back. And I'm trying not to panic, you know. Like I said, most people with our group were oblivious. They're like, hey, how you doing? Oh, no. (laughs) I'm like, like, so this is how I die. (laughs) What was the gender makeup of that group? Like... Oh, they were all male. Oh, you mean my group? Yeah, yeah, your group. Your group of 10 to 15, was it? We were probably half and half. Half and half, okay. Yeah, probably. There wasn't any one or the other. But obviously we're at men's prison, so the others were all men. Yeah, yeah. And of course, it seems like we were there for 15 minutes. We weren't. I mean, it probably was three to five seconds. Then the door opens again, and we can walk through. I think the person shut the door accidentally. I, wow. I, they were just so used to, hey, they're all in, shut the door. Yeah. Not realizing a tour group was coming through. <laughs> but, you know, it was five seconds of, ha ah. That's super scary. It was scary, you know. But why do you think that happened? Because that shouldn't have happened, right? I, I just think the person in the control booth, it was just a reflex. Right. They're all in, shut the door. And they didn't realize that we were coming through. I just don't think they did. If they'd have seen us coming through, they wouldn't have shut the door. Well, where were the inmates heading? I don't know. Okay. I didn't ask. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, you know, death row inmates, they don't really have a lot to lose. Yeah. So the next time that we went after yeah. that, we didn't even get to see the death row inmates. These inmates, they were out kind of like in general population. Mm. Um you know, with the other guys who could just be short timers or whatever, which I found very shocking. But after we went the next time, I guess a policy had changed or something, and we didn't even get to see them. We didn't even get to go on their hallway. Wow. Wow. Well, that's pretty scary to think about. It was. It's a you, gr- it makes for a great story. Did you did you tell any of your students afterwards, like, do y'all realize yeah. we were in there? Oh. Yeah. You were like, I mean, I didn't say it till we were, like, literally back in the van, but I'm like, yeah. you guys. <laughs> You guys, wow. seriously. I mean, seriously. Do you know where we were? Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was so, something. So what about women's campus? You know, the the men's prison is very institutional. You know, like I said, slamming doors, people behind windows, as little interaction between the guards and the inmates as they can. They, they minimize that as much as they can to protect the guards, obviously. You know, they showed us all kinds of shanks and knives. There was a big old display of shanks and knives and weapons that inmates had made over time that they had confiscated. They just wow. had, a, had a display of them, dozens of them, you know. So just to show how creative they can get, I guess. Yeah, I mean, they got nothing but time. Yeah. And, you know, I remember back then, and I don't know if this is still the policy, but I remember back then they told us that the inmates, and, and I'm, maybe this was just the maximum security inmates, but... They do not get visitors. They didn't get visitors at that time. And they got one phone call a year on Christmas Day. Wow. And hopefully somebody picked up because you didn't get like, oh, I'll call you back later. (laughs) You got one phone call. If you were not in maximum security, if you were in medium security, you could have a visit, but it was always through glass. There was no touching, no human interaction other than through glass, you know, using one of those telephone things. Mm -hmm. And so the women's campus, totally different. If I would have blindfolded you and dropped you down in the middle of central prison and said, where are you? You would have said, I'm in a prison. Mm -hmm. There were certain men that, depending on their status, they could go outside and and get one hour of sunshine a day. And they basically stood in a dog pen Mm -hmm. for that one hour of sunshine. And a guard was up above them with a rifle. So if they did anything, the guard knew that they could shoot. I mean, that was their recreation, was one hour on a concrete pad in a dog pen. Mm -hmm. 
So if I dropped you down to that, took the blindfold off, you'd say, whew, I'm at a prison. Mm -hmm. If I took you to women's campus, blindfolded you, took you in the middle of it and took the blindfold off and said, where are you? You would probably say, I have stepped back in time to maybe a 1950s campus or dorm or college Okay. Of some sort. Not a modern college. Like a commune of a some sort. A commune of some sort, yeah. yeah. Rows of dorms. Mm -hmm. One story, rows of dorms. Women dressed in either blue or green or yellow. They were color-coded, too? Yeah, everybody's color-coded. The death row inmates were not in the main campus area. They were in a different building, so they weren't part of the main campus. But you would think, you know, I'm in some type of retro campus area or just some old housing maybe some retro college of some sort did you feel safer there in a way now the women are walking around they have a courtyard area and they can all congregate out there and you know they're sitting on picnic tables or whatever it may have been picnic tables it may have been concrete tables I'm not sure but they're out there you know sitting around chit-chatting if they're not at work or don't have a job they're just sitting out there chit-chatting, or they may be... I don't think they can lay on their bunk all day. Now, you may have gotten off work and been able to lay on your bunk, like, until dinner or something like that. But you did have to get off your bunk and get out unless you were sick or had an excuse. But walking through those dorms, it really did look like, you know, an, an older college dorm mm -hmm. with a bunch of bunk beds in it. And, you know, the ladies had their own personal stuff laying around. The bathrooms look like regular dorm bathrooms. Any interesting stories while there? Well, you know, I just told you about visiting at yeah. the men's prison. Well, at the women's campus, they have a little house. And I don't know what the requirements are. You Obviously, you got to be on good behavior or whatever. But if you have done all the things that you're supposed to do, then your family can come and visit for a weekend. And you can live in this little house, which is inside the gates. I mean, you're in the prison wow. yard. But it's basically, you know, you've got a kitchen and a bedroom and a living room. And you're you play basically house for a little while with your you're, family. You're basically being a mom or a grandma with your family for the weekend if you've earned that privilege. Wow. To you don't do that at the men's camp. No. <laughs> so mm -hmm. That's just not going to happen. Obviously, there's more telephone privileges. There's more communication. There's more personal visits where you can actually touch your family and hold hands or have those kind of personal visits which are more limited in central prison were you so, ever able to talk to any of the inmates and we did not at central prison sometimes the guards would interact with maybe one prisoner or two and say introduce yourself buddy or something like that but nothing that was like set up or scheduled but at women's campus every time we went we always got to sit down with maybe one or two of the inmates who the prison chose. We didn't get to choose them, mm. who would sit down and talk to us. I wish I'd have done my homework before I came to meet with you today. I remember two specifically who were in there. One girl, she was a young girl. This was, once again, back in the 2000s. So it's been 20 years ago. And I would say she was probably in her early 30s at the time. But whenever she came in and started telling her story, the way she started her story was... I'm serving a life sentence for a DWI. That sounds extreme. <laughs> to which I, I wanted to say drama queen much. <laughs> now, you know, I, I, I Do know. Do you a, want us to be on your side? I know a little bit about DWIs and you don't get a life sentence. Even if you have a dozen of them, you don't get a life sentence. Yeah. Yeah. So what are the, what are we missing out of this DWI yeah. story? Some very important facts. So the DWI oh. story, why she's serving a quote life sentence is because she was drinking during the middle of the day. She lived at the beach, some I can't remember which beach, but somewhere in North Carolina. And pretty much lived a little bohemian lifestyle, you know. So that day she had just decided to go out drinking during the middle of the day. and was tooting around the beach area, her and her dog going from one bar to the next. And as she did, and as she was driving while impaired, she ran a stoplight and hit a car full of teenagers. Yikes. And killed four of them. Whoa. Yeah. And so she was convicted of vehicular manslaughter. Not just DWI. <laughs> exactly. And the judge was so displeased with her conduct 
that he, because I do seem to recall at the scene, she was very concerned about her dog, even though she had just killed four people. Yeah. I'm be concerned about my dog too, but yeah. nevertheless, a human life is a human life. Mm-hmm. So the judge was so displeased with her that he gave her, her sentences ran consecutively, not concurrently. Okay, so they didn't overlap. Right. You had to finish one before starting the next. And so she basically got, and I might, I can't remember the exact number, but let's say she got three 20-year sentences. Oh, sorry, four, four 20-year sentences. So she basically has an 80-year sentence, wow. and she was in her 30s then. So wow. she basically does have a life sentence. I found it interesting. She was so sympathetic and you know very remorseful, and this isn't fair, and... Everybody gets concurrent sentences, and I didn't get a concurrent sentence. I got a consecutive sentence, and everybody else gets concurrent sentences. And it's horrible here. Well, yeah, it's horrible being dead as well, you know. Four lives. Yeah. I mean, she extinguished four lives. But by the time we were leaving and got back to the van, I mean, I did have some students going, you know, we could send her money for the canteen, and we could contribute to her defense fund, and we could, and I was like, you, you people are not going to make it in criminal law. <laughs> wow. Or you might make it, but you're not going to make it on the prosecutor's side. Let's put wow. it that way. So anyway, that was one of them. The other, I could bore you with a dozen stories. The other one that really affected me, and I, once again, you're told what these people want you to know. You know? Yeah. You don't yeah. get to do background information. You don't get to do background source. And you certainly don't want to sit there and argue with them, right? But you, you do need to take all their stories with a grain of salt. Right. Yeah, absolutely. So there was a lady who was in there. She was serving, I believe, a life sentence. She was probably in her late 50s, early 60s. She was an older lady, and she had murdered her husband. She had killed him while he was asleep in his bed. I think she had shot him. Mm. I, I think that's what she did. Quick and easy. I can't remember exactly. It may have been something different, but she did kill him in bed, and she claimed that he had been abusive to her. And now, the problem with that was, whenever we asked more questions, there had never been any type of proof of abuse. So no, like, domestic filings? Mm -mm, No. Domestic, what do they call it when the police show up for um, things? Uh, no, no domestic violence complaints, the, no police calls saying, hey, my husband's abusive, my husband's hit me. No, no family members or friends seeing bruises. None of the children ever saw anything. Oh, they had children. Yeah, so none of the children ever saw anything. And she just said we kept it very private. It was very embarrassing. I didn't want people to know, but I just got to my breaking point, and I had had it, and that night was the night, and I just had had it. It was hard to swallow. Obviously, a jury didn't believe her because they convicted her, Mm -hmm. right? Yeah. I'm not the judge or the jury. I'm just saying, well, you had a chance with 12 people and they didn't believe you. I don't know what your evidence was, you know? I don't know what the prosecution put on. I don't know what they did. Something, she she doesn't sound very remorseful. I'm assuming she doesn't regret what she did. She does not. No, she said, I would rather be here than be living that lifestyle. She said it was just the worst. She said, I lived in it for, I can't remember how many decades and she just said, I couldn't take another day of it. So wow. those are the two stories that I remember the most. There were obviously stories of ladies on drugs and they had lost everything. They'd lost their children and everything because of, you know, drugs and things like that. And it was always interesting to hear the stories. I really want to continue with this, but <laughs> we have gone very long yes, already. We have. Yeah. Uh, how, uh, how about we save more stories for a later time? Absolutely. I think we could. Uh, Good place to stop. Take another walk down memory lane some <laughs> other time. Yeah. But, wow. Well, thank you for sharing. I could sit and listen to these all day. Yeah. I mean, it's just incredible the life stories that you hear in your line of work, but mm-hmm. also just how we all interweave and have our own yeah. narrations and they affect us. And like these women's stories have stayed with you for over 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. It's just crazy to think about. Maybe next time we can talk about some students or something like that. Oh yeah. Yeah. Cause I, I still keep in touch with some of the students and um, oh, almost like we could do a, where are they now? Or, yeah, that'd be or cool. where were they heading? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So let's do that. Uh, But no, I loved teaching. It was the best. And maybe in my next career, once I retire from law, I would love to teach. I want to teach in a classroom. I don't want to teach online. I've done that. And we can talk about that next time as well. Mm -hmm. The online, the classes are just not the same. You lose so much in, you know, everything. You lose everything, really. 
Mm-hmm. And I think we're doing our students a disservice, but that's just my personal opinion. And we can talk about that on another day. Yeah, yeah. Let's not bring out that soapbox. Yeah, that's just we, a teaser. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you so much for letting me join you again for another podcast. Yes. Thank you, Sophie and Sasha, for being so patient. And we'll see and hear from all of you next time on Laughter in the Law. Thank you for listening to Laughter in the Law, where we talk about the law with a lighthearted twist.